Hi everyone, this is Sarah from Hamilton. Today completes my discussion with Todd Wood and Paul Garner on the history and future of creationist thought. Today, Todd Wood leads us through the state of creationist biology, showing us a vision of a creationism which is not focused on merely critiquing evolutionary biology, but is rather willing to utilize all of the natural data in order to build a constructive model of the world faithful to the revelation of God in Scripture. I hope you enjoy this video, and please keep in mind that if you would like to ask Dr. Wood or Paul Garner a question, you can ask them in the comment section of this video, and I will ask the best of these questions in another interview set recorded in January. If you would like to support this channel and get access to regular and consistent exclusive content, please consider becoming a patron or paid Substack subscriber. At all tiers and as a paid subscriber on Substack, at $5 per month, you get access to all of my exclusive written content. I post daily reflections on scripture six days a week, and half of those are available only to patrons and paid subscribers. At $10 a month, at tier two of my Patreon, you get access to all of my exclusive written content, but also my exclusive video content, which is posted weekly, and each video is 30 to 45 minutes in length, usually reviewing a book, but drawing out the implications of that book for a holistic Orthodox Christian theological vision. At the top tier of my Patreon, $35 per month, you get access to all of my exclusive content, but you also are able to have a one-on-one -on -one monthly 60-minute call with me as long as you remain a patron at that tier. Also, if you would like to purchase icons or Orthodox apparel or any Orthodox material, please consider shopping at Orthodox Depot using the affiliate link in the description box and the pinned comment. 20% of your purchase goes to supporting this channel. Without your support, this channel would not be able to function, and I am incredibly grateful for everybody who both prays for me and supports me through Patreon and Substack. Thank you to everyone who watches, and I hope that you enjoyed this video. I want to move a little bit to the biological realm. Um, so, Todd, your work is on uh, brahminology. Uh, would you just tell the audience what is brahminology and uh, what distinguishes uh, your particular approach to brahminology or baraminology? I never know how to pronounce it exactly. Um, oh, no, I don't either. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so the, yeah, this... This is an old idea in creationism. So lots of people probably think that Henry Morris invented creationism, or maybe they think Ken Ham invented creationism even more recently. Um, creationist thought goes quite deep uh, in the history of science. You have to go hunting for it sometimes because it's not always, it's not, there's not an obvious thread carrying through where people are, are, you know, to building on what came before. We're changing that now, of course. But um, it's interesting to see the same sort of idea occurring to different generations. So I guess the most modern version of it comes in Frank Marsh's work from the 1940s. Uh, he wrote a book called Evolution, Creation, and Science, which was based on a self-published book called Fundamental Biology, which he published in quite early um i think it's it 40, 41 41 yeah, yeah i 41. think it was yeah. yeah yeah 41 for fundamental biology and 44 for the first edition of ecs and then 47 the second edition um he basically said uh, there's a couple of things that sort of wrapped around wrapped up into this one thing is that when you on the biblical side of things when you when you finish creation week you have human beings and land animals and birds and swimming things and fruit trees and other sorts of plants all together and all finished and they've been done in a week um so that suggests that okay well evidence of of deep ancestry the relatedness of all organisms must be misinterpreted that must mean something else, right? So the idea that I share a common ancestor with my cat and we share a common ancestor with a lizard and, and they share a common ancestor with, you know, with daisy or a sunflower or whatever, that, that, that's incorrect. That's a mistake. 
whatever that might mean for all the evidence in favor of that position. That's it's mistaken. The the trick though with the creation account is that it doesn't really get into much more detail, right? You get swim things that are swimming and things that are flying and, and things that are on the land. The only thing where it comes close to naming something really recognizable in the modern world is human beings. Um, and arguably the leaves, the fig leaves that they use to make the aprons. But other than that, there's not a lot of detail. The, the Bible doesn't, doesn't say. So what's been assumed over the years, and you can see this going way back to the be, sort of the beginning of science, is that we're talking about species. That every God made each individual species as we find it, and there hasn't been any change. Basically, from the beginning when that was proposed, people began to suggest that's probably not right. There are reasons to think that that's, that's not correct. One reason is that you get fertile hybridization between many different pairs of species. So, for example, in the, in the uh, 18th century, um, scientists, uh, a, a guy named John Hunter, uh, he pointed out, look, you got you got your wolves, your dog, domestic dog, jackals. They all hybridize and produce fertile offspring. And if that's the mark of what is a species, then those three species ought to be one species. And yet, you know, the species guys are like, no, no, no. They're clearly distinct and different, and they have their own separate properties. So, so there's always been this idea that. Uh, what what we think are species are probably not what God made. That God made some other, I don't know what to say, some ancestral population that produced the modern species. But when you look at the Bible, you realize, okay, well, it's not a, you know, it's not the origin of life. It's the origin of individual groups of life, not the origin of life itself as, you know, some sort of bacteria in a warm little pond, right? So. Another reason we think that species aren't, aren't really God's unit of creation is that no one really agrees on what they are. And this is something that Darwin capitalized on in Origin of Species. He says, you look at different specialists looking at the same group of creatures, and you're going to come up with as many different uh, species identifications as there are specialists, right? So one might say 500 species in this group, and one might see 550, and one might see 450. and that disagreement on what was a species for Darwin was an indicator that species just aren't constant. So, yeah. And then, of course, you have the relationship of island species to the nearest mainland and to geography. That was another thing that Darwin pointed out and capitalized on. It said, look, there's, there's, when you have unique species, it's not, they're not randomly distributed. It's not as if the creator came through and decided, I'll put some of these here and some of those there. They're related in time. They're related in space, right? So the, the, the nearest, the most similar species to any given species is going to be something almost certainly that's geographically close by, living nearby. So you put all that together and you sort of come up with this idea that, okay, God made ancestral populations of many different groups of what we now think of in professional biology as species. Uh, and that those species have diversified over time, that, that population diversified over time and became our modern species. And so then the question, of course, is, well, you know, what are these, what are these groups that you're talking about? We call them Brahmins for from the Hebrew bara meaning to create and mean meaning kind. So what are these things? And that's where, I mean, that's basically the bleeding edge of creationist research. From there, there are, there are, there are those of us who have been advocating for sort of a morphological approach to this question. Although by which I mean, you know, there are distinct differences between the created kinds that are detectable. Um, and I would acknowledge that's not necessarily a biblical concept, right? That's that's motivated primarily out of a survey of biology where we can recognize different groups of creatures at a certain level. Um, 
and then there are those who would argue that we need to use genetics and mutation rates and stuff like that to sort of trace back the ancestry because ultimately this is an ancestral question, not a question of morphology and what they appear to look like. So yeah, but I would say the the convergence of opinion, whether this opinion is motivated by empirical reality or not, is still a question we're wrestling with. But the convergence of opinion seems to be that whatever we think of, at least in mammals, as a family, that seems to be something close to the created kind. So there's there's several hundred mammal families. There's probably at least 4,500 living mammal species. So, yeah, you're looking at, on average, about 10 species per created kind. So people think, oh, this is massive hyper-evolution. No, it's, for the most part, it's hardly anything. <laughs> for, for your average uh, created kind, it's nothing. It's just a few minor changes and a few populations here and there. It's only the, the, the crazy ones that get really, where, where the speciation seems to go bonkers that people get really freaked out about. Paul already mentioned horses. That's an opinion that a lot of creationists don't like. Uh, they don't like <laughs> the idea of horse evolution being an evidence of created a single created kind changing. Um, so that's somewhat controversial. But but yeah, so sometimes you, you get into hot water with this because people start thinking, you're an evolutionist. No. <laughs> no, what I'm suggesting is about as boring as you could possibly get. As in terms of evolution, it's the it's the last the last five million years, and it's not very interesting. Yeah, and and I think you know this kind of gets to the heart of the question: What is creationism? You know, our yes. Concern here is not that we deny everything which might be designated as evolution. The concern is: Is the story of the world that we're telling compatible with the biblical history? And there's yeah. a range of ideas which could conceivably uh, be compatible with that biblical history. Um, and, and you've raised an issue which I think is one of the most interesting frontiers of creationist research and evolutionary research. So um, in Brahminology, I think you actually see the intersection of creation biology and evolutionary biology in certain ways. Could you comment a little yeah. bit on that? Well, yeah, you sort of see that. I mean, in, in, in some respect, it just depends on what model you're going to, how you're going to approach it. I think some creationists approach approach these questions of created kinds and so forth as if the tools of evolutionary biology just apply to created kind and it's just a matter of time and and the randomness of mutation that prevent meaningful changes from happening and so you know you can't change uh, an aardvark into an elephant because there's not been enough time to do it and random mutations are never going to bridge that gap so there you go. And they're basically approaching it as if random mutations and natural selection and the various tools of, of population biology are the are the tools we need to be using to understand creative kinds. I tend to be quite skeptical <laughs> of that sort of assumption. I'm, I'm looking at it thinking, uh, what's happening here doesn't look like evolution. If evolution is this slow process with random mutations, natural selection, and so forth, what's happening here does not look like that. It looks like something quite uniquely different. And so then the question, of course, becomes, well, what is this uniquely different thing that's happening that's producing these changes in these populations? And that's where I'm not quite sure. You know, I, I when I was younger, I proposed a big fancy theory that I thought of in my shower one day. You know how you know how bathing is for eureka moments. Um, so I can, became quite enamored with my idea about this, about these genetic, mobile genetic elements. And I thought this is probably how it works. And now in my my older ages, I've you know done a lot more genomics and a lot more study of genomes. I've just become a lot more I don't I don't know that I would be say skeptical. I'm a lot more cautious about what I think is going on with, with genomes. So yeah, so there's there's different ways of approaching it, right? So in the evolutionary biology world, everything is related to everything. So any comparison is fair game to tell you about mechanisms and so forth. 
Um, and within creation biology, you kind of need to identify a creative kind first or something that you think the community will all agree, nod sagely and say, yes, that sounds like a good creative kind. So that kind of limits the sorts of comparisons you could do. But then you do compare, you know, you compare, say, and this is the this is where it gets really weird to me. This is one of the reasons why I become somewhat cautious and maybe skeptical about my own ideas. So if you compare, let's say, a llama and a dromedary camel, right? Or maybe an alpaca and a dromedary camel. Very different on the outside, right? No chance you're ever going to mistake one for the other. They're very clearly distinct species. And in the evolutionary model, you know, you're talking about South American camels versus uh, camels from the old world. And so you're you're looking at a, a, a millions, tens of millions of years of evolution that are supposedly separating them. But when you look at their chromosomes, they're all laid out pretty much exactly the same. They have the same number of chromosomes, very similar chromosomes. It's a very boring genome comparison there because they're quite similar. Then uh, let's say we wanted to look at dogs, right? And you might look at the different foxes. There are red foxes, gray foxes, fennec foxes in the desert. And they all look, those are all foxes, no question. Those are, those are clearly foxes. Um, they're all very similar and they all have very sorts of similar body size and plan. And you can see it in their faces. That's a fox. Um, and you would think that would be their genomes would all be very similar and you would be quite wrong. Their genomes are all quite different. <laughs> and I don't mean slightly different in the sequence of the genomes. There's been chunks of chromosomes that have been rearranged. So the, the, the actual layout of their genomes is different. Same thing happens in horses. Um, it's, it's why a mule is sterile because the number of chromosomes in the donkey and the horse are not the same. So they don't line up correctly when, when you hybridize. They line up enough that you can produce an organism like a mule, but they don't line up well enough to produce gametes in order to reproduce. So it's goofy, right? And this is sort of where I've sort of left the situation as I've, as I've turned to more human origin studies is, is, is that there's this weird paradox where what's going on at the chromosomal level and the genetic level does not mirror what's happening at the morphological level. There seems to be these two separate domains that seem to be quite independent of one another, which doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> it, does, it just does not. And that's why I, you know, I think of it as a paradox. The, the, the genetics have to influence the morphology. We know this just from the science of genetics itself. And yet, when you try to pin down exactly what that is and how that influence works, you end up with these bizarre patterns where you find morphologically very divergent organisms that have very similar genomes, and you find things that very, very similar morphologically and yet genetically are quite, quite disjunct and distinct. Um, so, in terms of how it inter intersects with evolutionary biology, I guess it's it's. It, in some sense, depends on how skeptical you are of the mechanisms of evolutionary biology and how much they ought to or may apply to creationist thinking in this area. And I tend to be someone who is always questioning everything. Sacred cows, let's question them. And if they are good sacred cows, then they will remain sacred. And if they are not, then they deserve to be toppled. So, yeah. So, Todd, uh, you mentioned that the horse sequence, uh, that gets people up in arms, but you also mentioned that your research is focused on human brahminology. So could you tell us about your research on the human brahmin and how this intersects with some recent discoveries like uh, uh, a homo naledi, which was discovered soon after I became a creationist. And so that was super exciting for me to watch uh, your early uh, blog posts about that. So where are you yeah. going with this? Where am I going? Yeah, so um, so developing baromenology and baromenology methodology, how to how to recognize creative kinds. It was it was a challenge because you know I, as a as a 
skeptic of evolutionary applicability to creationist biology, I was I was busy trying to think of ways to identify created kinds that weren't evolutionary at their heart, right? So so that took, you know, I spent probably 15 years working on that. And I and I finally came around to a set of methods that I felt worked adequately well. And I'm very cautious about that because I don't want to, I don't, I don't have a, an in, uh, inerrant truth detector here in, in my methodology. It's, it's, it's a scientific technique, could be wrong. Um, but, you know, I, I, I turned to human origins uh, in the fall of 2009, just thinking, I wonder if it, if there's enough information out there that I could start using these methodologies on things like Australopithecus and, and these these ape men that we hear about so much. So yeah, so I thought, all right, well, let's see what happens. And I just started tinkering with it, and it and it basically started giving me these consistent results, which I was really kind of surprised and delighted by. I have to say, surprised perhaps because I hadn't ever really. Yeah, I hadn't ever really examined a single group with the level of detail that I was doing with humans. And so I guess it was kind of surprising and delightful to see that there was a consistent answer coming. Where, what got me in trouble is that the consistent answer was, was a bit wider than other creationists wanted to say. So I included things like um, uh, Homo hamilus in the, in the human kind. Um, and that was seen as just quite obviously wrong. And and that's part of the struggle that I've had with all of this is that it's it's always treated as an obvious answer. This there's no science needed here. We can just look at these and tell, which for a scientist is probably the most ludicrous re rebuttal you could provide. Nice job. It's just obvious, John. You're just wrong. Thanks. Very good argument there. So um so part of the story since then has been, okay, well, can we be sure? So this is one of the things that I've been wondering about, wondering about, and, and that is, can we be sure that some of these things are really what they are purported to be by the conventional paleoanthropology world, right? And, and what I found really interesting about that is that even when you get into paleoanthropology, there's a lot of anthropologists who just don't agree on what these fossils ought to be named. But there's a great deal of uncertainty among anthropologists about do these fossils belong together? And so what that, you know, what that said to me was, okay, well, I might be wrong about Homo habilis, that this combination of fossils that I have called Homo habilis is human. That might be wrong, but it probably is correct that some combination of those fossils do come from human beings. So that's kind of nice. Um, and then I've also been quite interested in broadening the, the perspective. It's, it's one thing to say, you know, these fossils belong to the human creative kind. It's quite another thing to come up with a story of where they came from and who they are and who they were. Um, so I've been very interested in trying to embed this into the, the story of the flood, the story of the recovery from the flood, the story of of and, and where it starts to bleed into archaeology, especially uh, biblical archaeology. So that's become sort of my bigger focus now is thinking about the question of human origins in, in much bigger, broader terms uh, and developing a model that sort of creates an interface between the world of archaeology as we know it and um, what I think is the right interpretation of the, the hominin fossil record. So that's my main focus right now. Uh, and it's and right now it's mostly, oddly enough, starting to overlap considerably with with the uh, the world of um, archaeology, which I never really expected. But I've always been a big admirer of archaeology. So that's kind of worked out. But yeah, so that's basically the story in a nutshell. Um, and it's and it's a story that's not done, and it will probably never be done, as long as we have these fragmentary remains um, to be discovered. Homo naledi, 
So you asked about that. Let me answer that here so, somewhat briefly. That's an interesting story that, that sort of emerged into my consciousness in the fall of 2015 when these these fossils were first announced. They come from a they come from this cave in South Africa. Uh, particular chambers in this cave contain a copious number of fossils, a, an astonishing number of fossils of these um, of these individual creatures. Um, they are anatomically quite distinct from us. They have very small skulls, and they tend to have very small brains to go with it. Uh, their shoulders are more, uh, the anatomy of their shoulders is more suitable for climbing. The uh, But the anatomy of their feet and legs look very similar to us. So, yeah, so what are they? And my original barbinology research indicated that they were human, which I thought, okay, well, that's nice. Uh, and it sort of comported with, it, that, that concorded with the interpretation that the researchers were giving that these were uh, individuals that were burying their dead in this cave. Well, burying, disposing of the bodies of their dead on specifics in the, the dark reaches of this cave. Um, now, it's been really interesting because there's been a lot of different opinion in creationists and a lot of different strongly stated opinions from creationists about what these are. And there have been lots of people who have just been adamant that these are not human in no way, shape, or form. Other people have argued that they were um, a mixture of human and non-human fossils. Um, I don't find any of those arguments very persuasive at all. In fact, I find some of them to be spectacularly unpersuasive. Um, but most recently, there have been claims coming from the cave now that there's evidence of fire use, there's evidence of engravings, and there's even been a claim that that these bones are not just randomly distributed, but they're placed in some kind of grave um, configuration, a burial, an actual burial in a grave. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've looked at that evidence, at least as, in as much as I am able to look at that evidence, and I remain... When the fire was announced, I was very excited. And I just was very excited to read the paper. And the paper has still not come out yet. That's It's been uh, uh, 10 months now. It's been a long time. So we're still waiting for any sort of responsible scientific description of what that evidence actually is, where it's distributed, how we know that it's associated with Homo naledi. We don't have that yet. So I'm left shrugging my shoulders on that one. I don't know what to say about that. Uh, the engraving, there's no evidence that um, Homo naledi made the, the engraving, other than a prox, uh, uh, association. The, the chamber where the Homo naledi remains are found, that's where the engravings are found. Did they make it? We don't know. Um, there's no clear, une unequivocal evidence to connect them together. And then the, um, the evidence of graves, I, at first I thought this is very good evidence, and the longer that I looked at it and thought about it and examined it, the more skeptical I've become and the more I think, I, I just don't know what this is. I, you know, it could be wishful thinking. It could be pareidolia. I don't know. I don't know because it's just not clear. So, so yeah. So, I, you know, the, the latest excitement about it, I'm sort of left shrugging my shoulders and I'm not sure what to think of it. Now, it does make a neat, convenient package, right? A package deal. If you've got fire engravings and localized skeletons in a cave and it's only those skeletons, it sure does make a nice story that they're the ones that made the fires, they're the ones that made the engravings, they're the ones putting the bodies in the ground. But the actual connecting tissue that puts that all together in a convincing story is currently absent. But my understanding of, of Naledi is that they're human. Uh, that's both from barominology and, and the evidence of body disposal that was for, put forward before um, the past two years. And I would still be inclined to, to, to think that if 
these engravings are connected to Homonaletti. And if these fires are connected to Homonaletti, I'm not the least bit surprised by any of that. So, so that's my take on the things. If you want me to talk about my story of human history, I can do that too. You probably do. I'd love to time permit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. Because that's kind of the, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road. So my, my, so my research in the past couple of years, I've been trying to come up with ways of, of like placing these fossils into a, uh, a historical context in the realm of the creation model. You know, where do they fall? Lots of people want to tell me that the Neanderthals, for example, are the Nephilim and that they are uh, pre-flood giants that got buried and that's where they came from. Uh, my work, I think, has shown rather conclusively that's not that story is incompatible with the rest of flood geology. If that's true, then we have misunderstood everything about flood geology, including everything that we know about the Grand Canyon, everything that we know about basically creationist geology. It's all wrong. So I'm I'm not inclined to accept that. And the reason that I say that is that these Neanderthals and their their living services are found typically in caves. 80% of them that I've surveyed, I surveyed a hundred and some different Neanderthal sites. I mean 80% of them are in caves or cave-like structures, so sinkholes or uh, rock overhangs, that sort of thing. And these things are carved into rock that was very clearly formed in the flood. It's Jurassic and and uh, Jurassic limestone, most typically in Europe. Uh, so that is, that's not possible. <laughs> that's not possible to survive through the flood. There's no way you can have a Neanderthal living in a cave prior to the flood when the cave is carved into rock made from the flood. That has to be after the flood. So I think that's where that positions these hominids. Most of these guys are going to be post-flood, uh, and they're going to represent those generations that are recovering from the devastation of the flood, that descend from Noah's family on the ark. Uh, and so, yeah, that's where I put them, and that's where that's how I then contextualize their their apparent primitiveness. It's not that they have. It's not that they are learning for the first time how to. I don't know, be civilized. It's that they have, they are sort of re, they've lost a cultural advantage due to dispersal from the Tower of Babel. And they are sort of relearning that culture. And it's probably only generations, uh, just a few generations that go through what we see as the Stone Age. They're, they're going through using stone tools onto using more sophisticated composite tools fairly quickly because they remember doing it. They remember doing it. Um, prior to the dispersal of Babel. So that's kind of my model. And then the question, of course, is, well, how does that then interface with evidence from archaeology, right? We know we have a ziggurat at Babylon. How does that relate to all the rest of this stuff? Great questions. That's what I'm working on right now. Well, we're excited to see that uh, mature and come to fruition. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's one of the great things about this uh, this set of questions and one of the most difficult things that the more you look at it, the more field it starts pulling in. Um, so I would encourage everyone to uh, check out your podcast and your your blog as well. And you also have a 2003, so not 20 years ago, book on uh, creationist biology called Understanding the Pattern of Life. Um, I know 20 years ago, it's a long time. There are things maybe you want to modify or change, but just would you tell me uh, just a little bit, what is the pattern of life you're talking about? And how do you think that then interfaces with theological questions? Like what is God trying to say in creating yeah. life in this way? Yeah, yeah, let me, let, me, let me just do that briefly. So the pattern of life there for me is this pattern of similarities that runs through all living things today. And even into those sort of the bleeding edge of the non-living world, this, the viruses and so forth. Um, and that there is, a pattern I think is unquestionable there. And I say that from years of experience studying similarities between humans and bacteria. Uh, there's definitely, there are definitely similar similarities there and there are detectable similarities. Um, and then for me then understanding that pattern, what is that? Pattern? The evolutionary biologist comes along and says it's a pattern that's the result of evolution. 
it is largely going to be a very complicated tangled up tree form. That's going to be the main form. Um, I tend to think that's not true. I tend to think there are more, there are other forms that are going to be more better fit for the data. Let's put it that way. Um, and then, and then for me, then understanding the pattern of life is really kind of the quest for the grand unifying theory, right? So we, I, I mentioned it before. It's it's one of my hobby horses. Um, I just feel like if we had a good creationist cosmogony and, and understanding of physics, uh, that the solutions to questions like radiometric dating would just fall out and you would go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And I feel like if we had a, a grand unifying understanding of what the pattern of life is and why the creator put it here, that things like the created kind would fall right out and you would know exactly what they were and there wouldn't be any controversy about it. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's what it is. And, and yeah, you're right. It's 20 years out of date, but pe people still get it and read it and tell me it's very influential. So uh, there's a lot of things I would change in it. Um, I wrote it when I was a young, cocky postdoc, um, but now I'm an old, cocky postdoc. And so... Still, I would probably write things differently. Maybe not as cocky as I was. How about that? Sure, sure. So just to wrap up, um, uh, could you both comment on uh, some outstanding unresolved questions that faced creationists today and maybe give some advice to young people who are interested in pursuing this uh, professionally? And also, uh, what, what can those of us who are not in the professional scientific world, what can we do to support this work and keep it moving forward? Mm. Give us money. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Both, both Paul and I work for these little these little uh, ministries who are donation dependent, so we always have to. Bring we always have to. We yeah. always have to give the plug. Yeah. Um, oh, in terms of unresolved questions, uh, there are so many unresolved questions and. I think the problem is that in scientific discovery, for every problem you solve, you come up with a whole load of new questions. Uh, so it's a kind of never ending quest. Um, but that's the fun, right? That's uh, it's, it's trying to, um, you know, answer those questions and then you come up with more questions and yeah, job security for scientists. Uh, <laughs> and it's, <laughs> and it's a lot of fun. Um, so in geology, let me think of a few geology things. We, we've already talked about the heat problem and, and, and those kinds of things, but there, there are lots of other things too. The fossil record, um, trying to understand better how the sequential burial of pre-flood ecosystems resulted in the fossil record that we have today uh, is a big question. Um we have made some steps towards answering that in part. Um, Todd and I and some others have been working on a project looking at order in the fossil record um, and uh, comparing the order of branching in evolutionary trees with the order in which groups appear in the fossil record to see whether um, there is a close correspondence between those two sets of data, which I think you would expect if evolution is true. And uh, we've been finding that in actual fact, um, there is a strong correlation in maybe a quarter of the evolutionary trees that we've looked at. So that's kind of interesting. And I think that kind of research might help to give us some clues as to what's going on as to, you know, reconstructing that pre-flood world and understanding processes that were going on during the flood, you know, to, to preserve that ecology in, in the fossil record. Um, Kurt Wise has done some interesting stuff, you know, reconstructing the floating forest and a hydrothermal stromatolite reef and, you know, things like this, but there's, there's a lot more to do. So trying to sort of understand that and, and particularly the fine scale resolution of biostratigraphy. Um, that's a big challenge, trying to understand, you know, fossils that show up in one layer and they show up in that one layer everywhere and they're not found below and they're not found above. And, you know, trying to explain um, the fine scale biostratigraphy, that's that's kind of a big question. Um, the Precambrian. So 
we talked a lot in this um, podcast about uh, the flood record, but what about the Precambrian, which creationists typically talk about as creation week or pre-flood rocks. But when you look at those um, Precambrian rocks, they seem to have a lot of history in, in the sense that they seem to preserve lots of sequential geological events. And how do we understand all of that? Um, you know, how do we make sense of that within uh, a creationist model? And uh, again, I think um, there's quite a bit of literature um, in the creationist journals about understanding the Precambrian, but not much consensus. Uh, lots of disagreement about how we unravel it. It's a, it's a kind of an enigma wrapped in a mystery, wrapped in a puzzle. You know, it's 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 a difficult one to solve. Um, there, there are lots of other other things too. I actually wrote a blog post. I, I have a long defunct blog, um, which I haven't updated, I think, since about 2014. But one of the most popular blog posts I wrote was the top five difficult problems for creation geology. So people might want to look that up. And uh, that that will give you an idea of maybe some of the the, the areas where we, we need more research. Um, it's not a surprise, I think, that we have lots of unsolved problems. Um, I, I think serious creationist research into these sorts of questions is relatively new. You know, it's not, it's not been going on for, for very long. And there are very few of us compared to the numbers of scientists in the conventional community working on evolutionary problems. And as Todd has already pointed out, we have virtually no money, no resources, so it's not a surprise, I think, that there's a lot of unanswered questions. But in fact, I, I would turn it round on its head and say, actually, it's remarkable that we've made the progress we have, um, given all of those constraints that, that, that we have. And uh, in terms of advice, I would say, yes, we definitely need more people. We definitely need people to be involved. We need new researchers to work on these problems, um, not just in geology or even in the physical sciences, but in all kinds of areas, biblical studies, theology, linguistics, you know, archaeology. There's all there's so many different areas. Whatever your discipline is, there are probably opportunities for you to be involved in building this, this creationist model. So I would say to young people who are interested, um, seek to get the best education that you can. Uh, study hard, maybe choose to study an area that's a particularly difficult area. Um, go and study radiometric dating or paleontology or, um, you know, evolutionary genetics. Go, go and study those areas, um, areas where we need some expertise. Find a niche, find an area where you can contribute. Maybe you could become the creationist expert in that in that discipline. Um, and, and really make you know an, an important contribution. Um, as you do that, I would say make sure that you get alongside other creationists who can help you and support you. Don't try and do it in isolation. Um, uh, it's it's very difficult, particularly if you're in the secular education system. If you're in a, in a secular university doing a PhD, that's a tough place to be. It can be a very lonely place to be as a creationist. So make sure that you're you're making contact with creation scholars who can who've been there, who've done that, who can help you. Um, come along to the Origins Conference in the summer. Um, find out about that on the creationbiology.org website. Um, usually the details are posted there every year. Um, come along. You'll meet other students. You'll meet creationist scholars. You can talk to them. Um, get their support you know build relationships with them um we'd, we'd love to see you so those are just some of the things i'd say to a young student todd how about you Sorry. oh we've lost we've lost your sound todd i think you've lost my sound oh, no, oh no. there we go you're Can back you sorry yeah the only thing i would add to that um <laughs> is is the excitement of the world of creationist research um, in other areas of research, I remember, you know, in, in my biochemistry field, there were a lot of open questions. Uh, and there were a lot of people actively pursuing those open questions. And so it was hard to find, you know, just one thing that you could do that would contribute to that growing field. 
in creationism, there is no such hardness to find where you contribute. <laughs> Everything is wide open. Everything literally is wide open. People come to me and say, how can I use my degree in whatever, ornithology? And I'm like, you know how many creationist ornithologists trained there are? I can't name. I We had one, and then he passed away. And then creationist botanists, we had one, and he passed away. Um, yeah, and on it goes. That's just how it is. Um, you can become the world expert in your field because there's just nobody else out there to compete with. <laughs> and we need experts in all of these fields. We need to be we need to be working on, you know, herpetology and ornithology and mammalogy and genetics and everything that you can imagine in biology sort of has to be evaluated and sort of brought into service of, of Christ and his kingdom. And so that's, that to me is exciting. It's just, everything is just so wide open. Come on. It's, 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 it's like a vast open frontier and we, we, we would love to have it. Well, thank you so much, guys. Uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, I hope uh, the audience has gotten a lot out of it. Uh, again, you can check out their podcast, Let's Talk Creation. I'll also be posting links to uh, the Core Academy of Science, places that you can financially uh, support them, things like that. So uh, thanks again for coming on. Thank We've you. really enjoyed it. It's, yeah, it's been yeah. great. I've really enjoyed this. Me too.